Uno, dos, tres. Welcome to episode four of Oops, I'm in a Cult. I'm your host, Charity Novelesi. And I'm Scott Barker. Today, we're going to be also speaking. Host. Also, <laughs> I, am, I am also a host. That's right. That's right. Today, we'll be speaking with Titus Walker, a former member who was a part of the original Break Your Spirit boot camp in Shiloh. He was a part of the Apostolic Company construction crew that was worked round the clock in all the different churches. When he was 23 years old, Titus was ultimately kicked out of the fellowship by the leaders themselves, Gary and Marilyn Hargrave. And this led him down a path of self-destruction that ultimately left him homeless and on the streets and dealing with addiction. He talks about how he climbed out of that hole and created a new life for himself, but how the consequences of this emotional, mental, and spiritual abuse as a youth affected him for the next 20 some years of his life let's get this started welcome to the whatever fucking podcast this is you don't want to mention that it's the living word no i think that's great but is it just gonna be called the living word cult podcast no no oh what could it be what could it be charity you and I are both former members of Living Word Fellowship. We're investigating the uh, the ins and outs of our experience. In and out podcast. <laughs> you can cut that part out. It's real casual. It guarantees it's going to break down very quickly, which is <laughs> totally fine. It's, it's the Living Word Fellowship. It's the walk. Thought it was a church, turned out it was a cult. Oh, there's a good... That's it. That's what it is. That's it. I mean, I kind of love it. It's not bad. It's not bad. Oops, I'm in a cult. <laughs> Today we have uh, Titus Walker on with us. Welcome, Titus. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Titus was part of the Living Word for a long time, and I think you're gonna have you're gonna tell us a little bit of your story and how you um how you know how long you were a part of it, and then part of what you have to tell us is how you got kicked out you weren't so much a blowout is that right (laughs) no uh they kicked me out officially yeah in retrospect you were one of the lucky ones but at the time i'm sure it did not feel that way right (laughs) no it did not it was uh you know you grow up in the church and just everything you know and then they uh remove that you know and they take it away and no one's allowed to talk to you. And it's funny how people follow those rules. There's a couple people that didn't, you know, uh, they were close, close friends and they just didn't really give a shit. So, uh, yeah, they take away everything you got and tell people not to talk to you and, you know, and then, you know, that's I'm devastating. Not sure how, huh? Well, that's devastating when it's the only thing you've ever known because you were born into the fellowship, correct? Yeah. So I started out in, uh, I was born in Laguna Beach. We went to the Anaheim church. Uh, we, my mom was part of the, you know, one of the, the girls that were under John and stuff like that. Uh, my dad left when I was around two or so. Uh, so I was with my mom for a long time. Uh, we would travel around, you know, the, the circuit every Sunday, every, seemed like every, you know, every chance we got, we were always at church and those Sundays were brutal. Cause you'd go from one church to the Valley to the, I mean, it was from sun up to sundown, uh, you know, <laughs> it's all church all I, the time. Yeah. And we, you know, I lived in the the Broadway house, which is a house next to the Anaheim church. And, uh, so we were always, you know, so when John was at Anaheim a lot, uh, we were always, you know, always over there. Uh, I remember him a little bit. I always remember, you know, it was a big deal when John was there, people were, you know, you had to be super quiet. Uh, I remember getting in trouble lots of times for making noise or, or whatever. How Uh, old were you at that time when you were frequenting JRS services? Uh, so as far as I know, I think. So I left for Hawaii when I was seven. So I was pretty much all around from, you know, I think we were in Iowa for a minute, but that was like, I was super little, but we pretty much all that I remember was Anaheim, went to the uh, Living Word School, the Anaheim, there's a school that we went to, Uh, was a part of that. I think 
Yeah. So I was, I was mostly at the, the Anaheim church. That was our home church, but we'd go to Southgate in the Valley a lot, you know, marathons driving up and down. I hated that ride all the time. Just, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's you not fun for like a kid. <laughs> yeah. You know, the only exciting part was like, uh, you know, when you'd leave and then they, you know, every once in a while to get to ride in John's van and we'd, we'd ride with Marilyn and, you know, I think Scott was there. I uh, can't remember who all the players were at that time, but I remember John and it was special to ride in the van. And then we would, I'd ride in their van till we got to, there was like a store that we used to go to. And then we'd go to that. We'd all meet at that store and get something to drink, some, you know, popsicle or whatever to keep you satiated, drive all the way down to Anaheim. That's like really interesting. The, the driving around and then like sometimes hitching a ride with, with John in in the yeah. van yeah. must have been a uh, quite the life. I know that I know that journey because I did the same thing. Southern California, driving from Orange mm-hmm. County up to Southgate to the Valley during feast every day for school because I went to the Valley School and all that kind of stuff. Right. Charity was also Anaheim, a bunch of Anaheim. Anaheim. Kids oh, here. Yeah, like we're uh, three OG yeah. Anaheim kids. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, left a I lot re- sooner than y'all did, but <laughs> you know that's a really interesting like kind of groundwork for where how what it's like to be like raised in the the church it's just like your parents are constantly doing this thing of like oh yeah going from here to here to here to here meetings like there's also during the week there was all kinds of stuff that you were constantly having to be pulled to um i think i think you you talked about like as you got a little bit older eventually you were chosen to be one of the kids that went to this like this special yasp session oh <laughs> i was chosen specially chosen <laughs> the boot camp was 89 the summer of 89 and that was bef- i think yes oh was yeah so yes was the next year okay so the, this the was pre young adult the summer reason program. they did yasp was because of our boot camp uh. we used to go to shiloh uh, 86, 87, 88. And during those times it was, you know, you had a, if you didn't, if your parent was, you could send your kids there and didn't have to have a parent. And then they would have, you know, high school kid, you know, or college level kids as your kind of your chaperone and they take care of you, you know, or whatever. And, uh, how old were you when you first started going? 86. So gosh, uh, six, so 12. Okay. 11, 12. Like I would fly alone from, from Maui. Uh, yeah. Cause so, uh, well, I don't want to mention names, but there was a kid that I grew up with when I first got to Hawaii and he used to go to Shiloh all the time. And I started going to Shiloh, uh, with him and, uh, I found out that you could go to Shiloh and not, you know, so it was great for my parents. They loved it. They're like, get lost. <laughs> So I go to Shiloh for like three months, you know, and, uh, so yeah, you could go there and you, uh, you could work or you didn't have to work. Like, you know, I liked working on Maryland farms cause it was, uh, can't mention the names, <laughs> uh, but he was a cool dude. I knew him from California and he moved out there and he was working on Maryland farms. And it was fun to work with him and you do stuff like that. And, uh, you know, you do fence posts and cool stuff and, you know, hang out with the boys like that. I didn't really do the construction crew, really. Um, I liked Maryland Farms at the time. Uh, but, yeah, you didn't have to really work. You you know, uh, I think, you you know, at the time they would make meals and stuff or you didn't or you ate from the snack bar. Or you went into Kelowna, you know, with somebody that you knew there and got a ride or whatever. So it was was just great. Yeah, this was just like a free for all. This wasn't like a program. It was just like, oh, we'll just send the kids to Iowa for to Shiloh for three months. That's that's summer camp. Just hang out, Mm -hmm. work on Maryland farms for free, of course. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. So you paid to go there. (laughs) You paid to go there and then you worked for free. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Right. right, Because you did. You had to pay. Well, airfare for one. But then you actually had to pay. uh, Yeah. Room and board. Fee. Yeah. Room and board. 
board. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so you worked manual labor and then yep. paid for and your paid lodging to, yeah, and yeah. your meals. <laughs> yeah. <that's right>. Yeah. <laughs> great, 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 uh, program great, for them. Yeah. It's a real good, real good setup <laughs> yeah. they got, they got going on there. <laughs> yeah. So a lot of kids would be out there. So that was the fun part. So you, you know, kids from all the other churches and stuff. And I was from Hawaii, so it was kind of isolated, you know? So it was fun to, to, um, uh, see other kids, you know? So when did the boot camp thing come into place? So, so that was in okay. 89, you said. So this is yeah. after you'd spent a couple of summers yeah. and you were how old? I was about 14, 15. Cause I went, so what happened was it was a free for all before that. And then they kind of, it started to get a little out of control, I guess. And so one day they just swooped up like six of us, seven of us. And we were the more outspoken, rowdier kids, I guess, you know, um, I won't mention any of the names of the kids in the boot camp, but, uh, they just gathered us up in the, like late at night one time and, uh, like dragged us into this room really. And, uh, it was a bunch was this of all boys. Yeah, it was, we were all, it was six of us and they just swooped us up out of all our different dorm rooms that we were staying in, you know, with other kids. Just out of the blue, get here, come here now, and dragged us into this room with uh, like four or five shepherds. Uh, can't remember who, but they basically told us, You guys are fucking assholes. You're just running, doing whatever you want. Fucking is too much, all this stuff. Told us we were pieces of shit and uh, we're gonna, that we needed to be. They said they're gonna break our spirits, is what they told us. And uh, so, the next morning, they woke us up at five o'clock, at five o'clock or four thirty, and that became our routine. They'd get us up at four thirty, five o'clock, and they would we'd go outside. It was dark, and they'd make us do calisthenics, and then they would run us for two miles. And I mean, if you've never ran two miles and they just started to run two miles, we were throwing up, puking, and it was no mercy. They didn't care keep going, keep going. You got to go. You know what I mean? It was just, it was a shock. So and wait, then, just a really quick look back. This was, you had gone out to Iowa just expecting, like gone out to Shiloh, yep. just expecting the normal summer thing summer, get yep. to go. And then they just one day, four o'clock in the yep. morning, just grabbed you by the shirt and pulled you into this room. And yep. suddenly you were in boot camp. And yep. that's how it started. That gotcha. was it. That was it. Okay. And then. So your parents, so yeah, did they get, up. did your parents get like a thing, a waiver to sign? They, I don't know if they, I don't think they signed a waiver, but I think they asked if it was okay to discipline our, discipline us in a way. You know what I mean? Uh, I'm not sure what they told them. <laughs> like I didn't, I don't know if they told them what they were, you know, what they were going to do to us. Mm-hmm. Maybe they, I, I'm not sure I wasn't a part of the conversation, but I'm pretty sure they called our parents and asked us. I think they did. I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't, to be honest. Yeah. Like, I wouldn't be surprised either. I don't, I, you know, were you I never parents, asked you my ever... mom. I never asked my mom if they asked permission. We don't really talk about that thing too much because it was pretty gnarly for me. What, what, why did they choose certain of you? Because it was your, we were the, this... we were the more, we, we were what they you would say the troublemakers, I guess we were the, the rowdy ones, uh, the way I, they didn't really have any excuse. They just said, you know, you're the, you're just at, they just started calling us names. You're assholes. You fucking pieces of shit. Basically, you know? You're, you're just, you just do whatever you want and that shit's done. You know what I mean? They just, it was gnarly. Uh, and a couple of the kids were a few years older than me at the time. So they were, you know, I'm not sure what they were doing, you know, but they rounded us up as we were the, we needed to be dealt with. Like you were the bad boys. Yeah. And I remember, you know, we being me and my close friend in that, that they took in, we would, uh, you know, we play pranks on each other and, you know, and other little kids and stuff. It was harmless. You know, we didn't beat Just anybody teenage, up. Or, teenage yeah, boy you know, stuff. Yeah. 14, 14 year old shenanigans, you know, it was yeah. nobody, <laughs> nobody went home crying or nothing, you know, it was just, right. you know, we'd prank, uh, I don't, can't say names. Anyway, we'd <laughs> prank some people, you know, 
but it was all in good fun, you know, and it was just, you know, short sheeting people's beds and doing, you know, nothing what's like a, what's a short sheet in someone's bed. What does that mean? So you, you basically make their bed and you short sheet their, their sheets underneath the blanket. So when they get in the bed, they can't put their feet in. <laughs> so it locks down the sheet basically. So you try to slide into your, can't like get into you your bed. Into <laughs> yeah, a truly and, harmless and, prank. Yeah, 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 a, you, know, yeah you, mean, you need to get your spirit broken for that one. For it, sure. You know what I'm yeah. saying? <laughs> and, and that was basically they just said we were assholes. Basically, I remember that they just said you guys are fucking assholes, and they were cussing at us a lot. Like they were pissed. You know, that must have been so and, confusing because you're like, I'm just being yeah, a kid, and you know, and maybe some of the older kids were doing more stuff you know because i didn't really we didn't really hang out with them too much because they were older and they were doing older things with older there were so many age groups that were just doing whatever at shiloh at the time you know so but it's also like you didn't sign up for the military like you signed up to go spend your summer in iowa it's like it then was suddenly you're in boot camp way. yeah and they literally that, called it boot camp did they not yeah, as i recall yeah, they called yeah. it boot camp so t- and, uh, take us more, take us more into the, that, like what they were camp. doing, you know, the boot camp and like the they left day. us off of like throwing up in the middle of your two mile run. What else yeah. was going on? So you would do that. You would come back, you would eat breakfast before everybody else got breakfast. And then when breakfast was served for the everyone else, you would serve breakfast to everybody. And then you would clean up the cafeteria after everybody was done. And then you would they would take us out into the fields below Shiloh and they wanted to get rid of all these rose bushes at the time. It was, it was just plagued with these thorny ass rose bushes. And we would, you know, uh, remove rose bushes all day long. We would come in before lunch or we'd come in at lunch or can't remember if we would come in before every, I think we would come in before everybody at lunch that we would serve lunch to everybody. And then we would clean the cafeteria after everybody was done eating. And then we'd go back out and do rose bushes. And then when it was time for dinner, we would come in, eat our dinner, and then we would serve dinner and then clean the cafeteria after dinner. So you're basically working all day through your meals. Like you're not, you don't get any time to to rest or really even, yeah, you don't get a lunch break. There was no rest. The only rest that came was, and they, they nipped this in the butt. But uh, we so after if there wasn't a church service that night, uh, we would go clean that we'd finish cleaning the cafeteria and then we would go scrub bathrooms with fucking toothbrushes. Okay. It would make us scrub all the toilets, all the showers with, you know, with uh, toothbrushes, basically. And we would I remember do that. Them so- having you. Didn't they have you like, I remember seeing you guys at the farmhouse and I was really young, but I remember like them having you pick rocks or something like move pet oh, yeah. rocks, it, little yeah, rocks. They, it, yeah. Anything to, you know, if we didn't, they, if, if, cause you got to understand when we were doing this, I was starting to get pissed, you know, cause we would work till like 1030 at night scrubbing bathrooms, whatever they had. So we would get to bed at like 10, 1030 at night. And then they would wake us up at five in the morning to do calisthenics and run and do it all over. And I was, I was starting to get pissed and I started, you know, mouthing off and, you know, which made it worse. And, uh, so they started making me do dumb things, you know, like I was telling you charity about how, uh, I remember when I, I didn't want to eat my peas, <laughs> I hated peas and I didn't want to eat those damn peas. So I was taken out behind the, what was it? The maintenance building. Mm-hmm. One out, out past the, the cafeteria, you go out by the building and then there's that little building on the outside and there's that little ramp in the back. So they took yep. me out back there and I was made to do push ups over my plate of peas until I ate them. And so fucking stupid. <laughs> Yeah. And then, yeah, they would just, you know, they just worked the shit out of us and they were just until we, and if I, you know, I was real lippy cause I was, you know, it was starting to get to me and I would mouth off and mouth off and they would, you know, they, uh, 
and they would have an answer for me. They would make it worse, make it worse. You know, now you're doing, now you're doing double time. Now you're doing, you know, just to, anytime I had anything to say until I just bowed down and broke, yeah. you know, they were gonna, they were gonna break me. And I told Joel the other day, it felt like honestly, after it was all done, I, they basically neutered me. I was not the same person that I was after that boot camp. Like I was super outgoing before that. And they really just, I became very introverted, I guess. I was still outgoing and, you know, but I wasn't the person that I was before that. And that's, that's really, really sad. Where they, that's really where they robbed me, you know, of that person. They, and you were so young. You were about 13, you said? 13, 13 or 14. 14. Because that year, and the crazy part is after all of this, <laughs> I asked to stay. Well, I asked to stay in Shiloh. So I stayed in Shiloh the, that whole school year after that. That was 89, 90. That was my ninth grade year. So I didn't oh, want yeah. to go back to Hawaii. I forgot you lived there for that. Yeah, I remember that now. That was right. Why after didn't the Why didn't you want to go back to Hawaii? Because I didn't want to go back to Hawaii. It was so rough. I fought every day. I, you know, just I would I would have to stay in classrooms during, you know, because it was just if you walk the halls, it was, you know, they just loved to beat up white kids, especially little white redheaded kids. <laughs> you know, it was rough, and so I would rather have gone and stayed in Shiloh for a year than deal with going back to Hawaii. And then the cool part about mid Prairie was, I don't know if they still do it, but ninth grade is still junior high. Mm -hmm. So I didn't yeah, have to it's go not anymore, and, but it was that way when I was there too. Yeah. yeah. And it was really cool. So I didn't have to be like, I didn't have to go to Hawaii and do the freshman year at, you know, Maui high, which would have been just, you know, like LA County jail, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so you just, you what was it like for you? The year that you stayed in Shiloh, did, were they still just on your ass constantly? And No, it mellowed out. And Scott told me, he's like, hey, man, he didn't want me to stay. He's like, if you stay, this is this, this, you know, this could be boot camp all year. And I was just like, whatever, you know, I just didn't want to go back to Hawaii. I just wanted to be around, you know, other people. How long and was it, that it, first boot camp? The months. As long as the whole summer was. Okay. And they, I mean, they used to march us down the hallway. We weren't allowed to look at anyone. We weren't allowed to talk to anybody. We, they'd march us in a single file line. People would see us when we walked by and just be like, you know, what the fuck's going on with these guys? You know, they were told not to talk to us. We weren't allowed to talk to anybody. I was going to say the only time I ever got any rest was when we, we were allowed to go to church when they would have a service, you know, because it was during the summer. So they had a lot of evening services. And, uh, that was the only time to get a break. And you would see all of us just, you know, on our, <laughs> <laughs> trying to get some sort of sleep. And then they saw us sleeping. So they nipped that in the bud and, and started making us take notes to keep us awake. And then we had to, we had to show us that we had to show us, show them our notes when we got done. And then when the service was over, we'd have to go back to scrubbing toilets and cleaning the bathrooms. So it was God. just, that is just, it was, it was brutal. Yeah, that is brutal. I mean, being forced to sit through service as your break is awful. A uh, Gary, sir, any of those, <laughs> any of those guys that are talking out there, that's like the worst thing I could think of. I, I don't want to leave the boot camp too because I don't want these guys getting away with this. If it was yeah. just, even if it was just one summer, this is like awful sounding that you would do this for. They broke me. They did what they accomplished, and that, and like I said, they broke me, and I was not the same person when it was done. To this day, I still look back at it and I'm, and I, and I sit there and I go, where would my personality be different? You know, cause I was so outgoing before that. Like I just would make friends everywhere I went always just, I was good at it. And then, you know, eventually, I don't know if it's just cause you get older or whatever that you kind of get more insecure or whatever, but I'm not, no, I, I'm not that kid. I really, no I can see that. I mean, that just having grown up in that atmosphere myself, and obviously I didn't go through the boot camp experience, but th there was always that, um, mm -hmm. put, putting you down if, especially yeah. if you were on like Scott and I've talked about this, I think with the Sam and Lenny episode where, Sam was 
you know, put down for being too introverted and I was put down for being too extroverted. And it was like the only way they would accept you is if you just fell right down that middle line. But so like the fact that you were outgoing and probably like kind of free spirited. Right. And they made you feel like that was (laughs) trying trying to. to, (laughs) Yeah. And that's what's sad is like they made they called you a fucking asshole and they made you feel like a piece of shit. And you were Mm -hmm. you were physically punished for expressing your personality, even like mouthing off. I think yes. that's great that you mouthed off because that showed you had, you know, your own like mind, yeah. but that yeah. was a big no, no with them. So it's no wonder that you didn't feel like yourself after that. I want to, yeah. I want to hear Titus, what is it? And when is it, can you explain like, how did it change for you? Did you notice the change? Do you, can you look back and think like, what, what was it? The thing that like, finally you gave up on being who you were before. So after doing it for so long, those months of doing it, you just like the running you got, you do it every morning. You're going to get good at running. You know, you got stronger, you know, we did get stronger, do more push ups. You know, it was just natural, you know, you're made to do these things. They would, and the, you know, there was mornings that we didn't, when we didn't go out jogging, they would make us, there was this big hill behind Gary and Marilyn's apartment to the, the window to their, you know, their whatever apartment in the building. And, uh, they used to make us run and do hills. It was, we would have to run up and down this hill and Gary and Marilyn would sit in the window and like, watch you, you know? <laughs> That's um, so disgusting right the king and queen up in their lair mm-hmm. just watching mm-hmm. oh gross yeah. that's so angering yeah and uh so but yeah so after doing it for so long you just you learn to fall in line you just you know they it's like a real boot camp what they do in the military they break you down and they you know they reform your mind to become part of a unit and that's what we did we just you just well, and they didn't break the, you down the, to the silo board, you know, the, well, you know, it, what do they wanted you to be, you know, exactly. You just, I was going to say they didn't break you down to build you up. They broke no, you down to, 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 to make you conform to what they yes. wanted you to be. And then, and then pretty soon you, you, you started to feel like the, the more you fell in line, the more privileges you got, like they would back off on you. You know what I mean? So you just kind of learn to, you know, oh, I'm, you know, and then people, after a while, people knew us as like, Ooh, the boot camp kids. So you'd walk down the hall almost like, yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just a fight. It was just fucked up. You know, they fucked your head up so bad. You just started, you know, believing that, you know, no, this is, this is good. You know, this is a good thing. I needed this. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it works right they yeah. make you believe that you deserve to be punished and this is all for your own good and so then yeah then i did the year in shiloh and then after that you go to yasp and so now you were just a good kid and you couldn't wait to get on the, the shepherd's list to be the you know what i mean because then when it came to yes you had to be invited and they started doing it in sections you know like groups like a certain group would go with this group they didn't just maybe that was the second year. I can't remember if they did that the first year, but I remember them. You, you got, you got a lot of like, I couldn't necessarily like they split. I remember they split me and my best friend from Hawaii up. And so that we wouldn't be together at Yas because if they, they felt like if we got together, then, you know, all hell was going to break loose. And so they, they would set you up in groups where they felt like, you know, they could, you wouldn't have a friend there to, you know, confide in or whatever. You just had to deal with the people that you were with in that group and then learn those people. And it kind of cut down on the, the clicking up, I guess, but I mean, that stuff still happened, but you know, I remember they would never let me and my best friend from Hawaii go at the same time, especially. Well, they they liked to, they liked to isolate people. So you didn't Mm -hmm. have a confidant. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. That's the best way to get 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 you to be what they want you to be instead of who you identify as. If you have your friend, yeah. your best friend from Hawaii there, you guys can mm-hmm. look at each other and be like, I know you outside of this, we'll survive yeah. kind of thing. But no yeah. one else there, then it's just whatever 
they have in you're store on for your you. Own. Yeah, yeah, you're on your own. And you have yeah. to conform to survive, basically. Mm-hmm. I yeah. do remember that first year of YASP, too, when they it was like they told you which session that you mm-hmm. could come to. And then if mm-hmm. you were there and weren't officially a part of that session, you, you weren't allowed to talk to the people. Yep. Nope. nope. I remember getting in big trouble because I was going up the stairs at Shiloh. I was not in Yasp on this particular session. I was walking yeah. up the stairs and another girl was walking down the stairs who was a friend of mine and she was yeah. in Yasp already. And all she did was say hi to me and like, like jokingly not let me up the stairs. And yeah. then it happened that the leader of Yasp was walking up behind me. And didn't see the whole interaction. But then she goes, why were you talking to her? And I was like, I wasn't, you know, I'm like, I wasn't. She's like, don't lie to me. Don't lie to me. I know you were talking to her. It's like, oh my God, what is this summer camp? Or like, yeah. am I in a nightmare? It was- <laughs> yeah, and you were in they, a nightmare they, charity. That's what it was. Yeah, it really was. was. <laughs> right. And then they had, and then they had uh, kids our age run the groups. So that gave them a little bit of authority. So then they, you know, you'd have these kids that just, you know. Exactly like that, you know, and, and not necessarily like in the beginning, I think they had like grown up ones. But as the ask went on, it was like they would pick kind of somebody in your age group to lead the group or whatever. But, you know, and then they got a little bit of power. But then you had like, remember, it was dorm moms and dorm dads and all that yeah. stuff, you know. Oh, Do you remember so- they made us they made us fold our they made us watch videos on how we had to make our beds and fold our clothes like everything had to be done in this exact way. Yep. Yeah, you had to have the the military uh, made up bed. You know, it had mm-hmm. to be with the sheet sheet out, folded, tucked. The, all your shoes. The quarter had to test. Be. Yeah, man. I think after boot camp, they really felt like it. You know, they accomplished what they needed to accomplish in that, and they took a lot of that regiment and put it towards you know Jaspers when they came in the you know when they came in for that their sessions and stuff, you know, and I get some of it in a sense that if you have so many people, it just can become messy and chaotic, but you know, I'm sure it wasn't just that it's, it's really that, you know, you're going to do what we tell you to do and this is the way you do it. And, you know, Oh yeah. They, they, I mean, we would get in trouble for really ridiculous stuff. Like, yeah. yeah, like I remember my, uh, my girlfriend and I, we were Sneaking in a dorm together and we were, stuff. oh my God, they, they starved us, especially during the McDougal years. It was like, but I remember my girlfriend and I were laughing during nap time because, you know, they had us doing manual oh. labor all the time and we did get naps unlike you poor mm-hmm. boot camp boys, but, right. and she and I got the giggles. She, she and I got the giggles and like our dorm mom went and ratted on us. And then the leader of Yasp came and was like, made us go scrub the walk-in refrigerator with toothbrushes just because we were giggling during nap time. <laughs> right. That was their go-to, man. It was just punish you. You need to be punished, yeah. you know, go pull weeds, go move rocks. Cause move them from here to here, you know, dig a hole and throw a rock in it and bury it, you know, dumb shit. You know, they just wanted to, let you know who was in charge. And if you buck mm-hmm. that system, it was just, it was game over, you know? Why and do you think it was that we still wanted to go? For me, it was my getaway from Hawaii. And there was, and then eventually as Yas came about, like way more kids started showing up. So it was just, you kind of dealt with it because in the meantime, it was like, even though you're doing shitty things, you were doing it with your friends, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, we'd every once in a while, we'd go on trips and stuff. They'd get us in that old fucking checkered cab and pile us in like sardines. And <laughs> we'd, you know, get a go to Iowa City or something or, you know. I just whatever. remember the one trip of summer was like Wacky Waters, like the shittiest oh, yeah. water park. In that shit <laughs> that was, was fun. The excitement. I remember that. That was actually <laughs> was fun. It was the o- like, only fun thing we got to do mm-hmm. practically. Unless, you know, we'd get to go to the, the lake when they finished the lake or whatever and swim in that shit water. That oh, my God. Great. It was chock full of leeches. <laughs> leeches. I know. Everybody, they had to, like, put hydrogen peroxide in your ears when you got back and, <laughs> and all kinds of, you know, the leeches. Oh, we'd have word. leeches. And, oh, yeah, it was awesome. <laughs> so what, a great, what a great summer camp. Uh, you know it's so like i said what got me there was the kids it was all i wanted to do was hang out with my friends you meet so many people from all the you know different states and you you create relationships that are amazing and i would look forward to that every summer that i went and i think 
think 92 was the last year I went. Yeah, 91 or 92. So what did you, um, you went back to, you were in Maui, right? Yeah. Yeah. So what's the, what was your, what did you end up doing? You didn't leave the church at this point. You're still part of it. And um, Charity was saying that you were part of the construction crew out there or. Yeah. So I got, so I graduated in 93 and I worked, I worked for a, a, you know, living word company in the church. This was landscaping. Body builders or. Uh, I, uh, uh, Island plant. Okay. It was there. It's the, like the landscape company. I don't know if it was necessarily a body company, but I think, you know, it was I know run they, by people that were members of the Yeah. Church. And they gave a lot of money <laughs> to the church. Yeah. So I don't, you know, what constitutes a, I, cause I remember impact. I remember being an impact in Anaheim, you know, running around impact. So it wasn't really like a company like that ran, but where it was all just, but the island plant had civil, I guess civilians, civilians, <laughs> <laughs> and and church people that worked for it. You know, uh, it wasn't bad. It was it was you know it is what it is. It was a job right out of high school, uh, and then I moved to Oahu because I didn't want to be. You know, I was paying rent already since I was like sixteen, so. Uh, I was like, I want to, I want to, I want to go somewhere. So I called up the shepherd at the time that was over the Oahu church. And he said, yeah, come on over. So I spent two years on Oahu. And then when I came back, uh, I started getting into, you know, I wasn't really coming around the church. I was kind of, you know, doing my own thing. And they said, Hey, you know, you're, 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 you know, floating off. <laughs> And, uh, so they said, Hey, uh, you got an invitation to get on the, uh, the living word, uh, construction crew. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, that's, you know, I finally made it. Woo. APCO. <laughs> yeah. Pulled, and this was up. body wide, body wide builders before it was body wide builders, right? Before like, it was oh, body wide okay. builders. Yeah. yeah. Body wide builders, I think was a brainchild of, well, no mention names, but that came later. Yeah. So when I got, I was on APCO's payroll. So I made like oh, okay. $800 a month, but I still had to pay to live at Shiloh. Uh, had to pay for my own food. Oh, so they shipped yeah. you, you, you joined up the, the construction crew and they shipped you off to Iowa. Yeah. To, so I okay. was in Iowa. We finished up what was coming to the end of the Shiloh, you know, remodel. I hadn't been there in years, you know, since like 92. So it had changed a lot. They had, you know, amphitheater was done. When I was there, we were sitting on hay bales and shit. Um, and so you made eight, $800 a month. And how much did yeah. you have to pay to live in the what, a dorm room at Shiloh? In one of the apartments down below. Yeah. Okay. Um, where I lived with uh, the guy that's visiting me right now. <laughs> we lived together. <laughs> and he was on the crew, too. Uh but yeah, we paid like two or three hundred dollars to stay there. So it was a big chunk of years. Oh yeah. Yeah. So they were they were doubling up on the money that plus food. That was donated to them. And then they were so it was just a, you know, revolving give it to Yeah, it wasn't back they you. you didn't get any you didn't get any perks no. by working for them. They didn't no, you they paid, didn't you cut your deal. Food, yeah. Paid for everything. Yeah, interesting. Except okay. for when you moved on out of Shiloh, you know, you were put up by the next church that we would go to because to, that, we kind of that's what we did. We traveled around and whatever church had a, a need, we'd help out and build something or, or you know whatever their thing was, and then we'd move on to the next one. So we went from Shiloh, finished up like the carport and the in the entryway. That's what I did with Rob, and yeah. So you would start your day at 6.30 and, and, uh, we would, uh, we'd work till like 10.30 at night. And if I didn't, I was, you know, like, what do you mean? You're not going to work till 10. 
you know, <laughs> I was like, well, they'd, they'd give you, they'd give you it wasn't shit. An eight hour shift. Let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. And then when you did, and it wasn't work, optional. So, no. And it wasn't. Op- well, yeah. I mean, no, basically. I mean, if you didn't do it, they were just going to kick you off the crew, I guess. I don't know. You just did it. That's what you did. Well, you know? it sounds and like it was, the, yeah, the boot camp was, um, it paid off. They trained you well. Yeah. Yeah. You were, you know, it was okay to use me, you know, it was just, you just learned that that was just part of the deal, I guess. I know that feeling yeah, you're talking about where it's like they, where they would, you know, technically they're not forcing you to work those long hours, but you know, no. the consequences if you don't, which are, they will ostracize you and ridicule you and treat you like shit what, and possibly kick we, you off the crew. Yeah. Cause what we were doing was for Marilyn's heart, you know? That was what we were told. This is what we do. This is Marilyn's heart is this thing. And, and we're, we're working for Marilyn and you're giving yourself to Marilyn when you're doing this. And it was always about Marilyn and her heart, you know? And, uh, so it was always Isn't that interesting know, where it was like always all, all about Marilyn. It wasn't about mm-hmm. God or like, no. you know, the, the no, Lord. You weren't working it for was God. You were working for Marilyn who was the, the voice of God and Gary were the voice, you know, they were the, you know, the so-called Christ on the earth, you know, mm-hmm. vessel to Jesus, you know, to God. <laughs> right. So, so gross. everything you did was for if you and if you didn't, the harder you worked, it just showed m- how much more you love them, you know. And that's just kind of what they beat into your head. And if you didn't do it, they were just like, you know, what's your. There, then yeah. you were not accepted in no. that uh, in that kind of an organization. When and especially when you're raised in it, you come to understand that it, if you're not accepted, life is over. Yeah. Like basically, you're you're kicked out of your family. Yeah, is essentially what it feels like. Yeah, yeah. So I felt really special being a part of the crew. You know, I was like, oh wow. You know, I felt super special being invited to be on the APCO payroll. You know, at the time, which, you know, it's like I made it, <laughs> I guess, you yeah. know, it's like anybody who aspires to be a shepherd in the church, you know, as you're growing up there, you're just like one day, you know, school of prophets, <laughs> school of prophets. And then one day I'll be a shepherd and, and now everything will be great. <laughs> you, you wanted to be and thought you would be a shepherd. Yeah. Doing this stuff. when I was yeah. younger, it was my heart. I love the word to this day. You know, I'm very spiritual. It was, it's always, it was always in my heart. You know, I just figured one day, because that's what they were training us to be. It was the next, you know, the future generation of shepherds. Some of us yeah. made it, you know, there's a few people I remember like, oh, wow, they're, they're running this church now. And you're like, oh shit, I used to beat that kid up. <laughs> 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 i think i think you got the better the better deal in the end titus <laughs> i do i do and that's something i you know eventually came to realize yeah. yeah i want to i want to hear then a little bit about how you know that didn't work out and you ended up getting kicked out like how did that all come to play because okay. it sounds like you really you really were i mean you were giving your physical you know, energy, everything to follow Marilyn's heart. You also wanted to be like a shepherd and a part of the word and a part of the movement and the big purpose behind this. You weren't just like, oh, well, I guess I'll work construction because who knows? It sounds like you wanted to really be involved in it. Um, How did you end up getting pushed out of it? So the culmination of the construction crew for me was we ended up the, my last stop was in LA and that's when they did this huge remodel of the LA church, the CLW church, church yeah. of the living world yeah. in CLW. North Hills. Yeah. 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 And, uh, so, and we were doing this mad push, you know, push, 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 push to get it all done for Gary and Marilyn. Cause they were going to be there and they wanted to have it. They wanted to, everything done. I remember we did a, a 48 hour shift, you know, that was crazy. Jesus. I, re- I fell asleep. I remember I fell asleep next to a jackhammer. I was so tired. I was going to say, isn't that, that's not safe to be doing construction when you're sleep deprived. But that's how the construction crew worked. You just, you pushed until the job got done. 
And so, yeah, we did a 48 hour shift. And I remember I went home early and because we were staying at one of the, you know, the people in the church's house, they put us up and I, or they put they spread us all out in the house that I was at. I went back to that house and I was like, I'm done. I'm out. And they kept right. The guys, the other guys kept working. Right. And I was just like, I'm done. This is this is ridiculous. I can't even you know think right now. So I, uh, you know, had somebody take me to the house there and I went and crawled into bed. And then I get a phone call later on, like, what the hell, dude? Where'd you go? Shift wasn't done. We weren't done. All the other guys are working and you decided to go that you just needed to take a take a nap. <laughs> this is how they yelled at me. And I was just like, you know what? F you, man. I don't give a shit. And I was always used to getting yelled at. So, you know, after a while, you just, you know, that shit rolls off your back. But you just, I just, I did whatever I wanted when I decided that it was, I had enough, you know? So apparently 48 hours wasn't acceptable in the end, you know? And uh, <laughs> I was just like, I'm done being slave driven. We got to the end of the uh, the remodel and I said, and they were going back to Hawaii and uh, I didn't want to go back to Hawaii. So I asked to get off the construction crew and that was like a whole you know, disappointment. I remember uh, Scott McDonald telling me, you know, he was just like, oh, great. Now I got to find a place for you to live, you know, just like <laughs> totally put out by my decision to, you know, stay in LA. And, to do uh, something that it would make you happy. Like, how dare you ask for that? What? <laughs> you know? Like, you know, he's like, I don't know where you go from here, you know? And I'm just like, oh, yeah. Just, it kind of sounds you know, like. Yeah. It's, like it just, it sounds like they're not, they're not, it's like that. Where do you like, like, what do we do with you now? Like, Oh, you show yeah, that you pretty much. aren't um, loyal to the end. Yeah. like Everybody else. I understand that same thing of like go, that, that going home thing. I saw the same crap in the audio booth. It was like, yeah, you're working on one of the big shows or something like that. And <laughs> they somebody gets tired or somebody like goes and lays down on like a couch or whatever and it's just like hey man we're we gotta push we gotta we gotta do this thing you're like we've been working like non-stop and yep. you're yelling at me for sleeping you know yeah that's yeah. Uh, meanwhile the people that are yelling at you for sleeping just woke up you know and yeah after a come bender the, the night building. before or whatever <laughs> yeah <laughs> How dare you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you had a job to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, so I, I asked to stay and I, they've let me stay and, uh, I ended up staying with my aunt and uncle and, uh, I was, you know, I think I was kind of coming to the end of my, just, I was over it, you know, just, just, you know, I, I was, I was 23 at the time when I, when I stepped off the crew and, uh, I was just, you know, I was 23. I wanted to do some stuff and I knew the kids in the church, you know, there. So, and those kids, you know, would go do stuff. So I'd go do stuff with them and, uh, you know, started making a little life for me in LA and being a part of the CLW and this and that, but I was never really accepted. Like people would just be like, you know, who's this guy <laughs> other than the kids that were my age that knew me, um, you know, but why do you think that is? I don't know. I, I think it was just because L.A. people in the in that church, if you weren't if you didn't grow up there and weren't just a part of their thing forever, you weren't really, you know, especially TLW. Mm -hmm. TLW was weird. That whole like two church dynamic, you know, mm -hmm. was so weird. Like you I just remember going to TLW and just being like, oh, that was fucking shithole. So dark and dingy and. You know, like just yeah. So and and TLW. Like, what are you was, all doing here? Like they're all in their little <laughs> headphones on, doing weird uh, shit. You know, I don't fucking. The I Living don't know Word, what. the Living Word <laughs> building was where they did all of the Living Word publications. Like they right. all the the editing of the recordings right. of the sermons and all the literature so that's what they, they were published. Doing. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, it's yeah, the clickiest but there was, of the click there. In yeah, the TLW, it was the like, most the most clicky, and then like within lots TLW, of alcohol. Of yeah. Lots of alcohol. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, talk about that. I mean, talk. Oh, yeah. No, it was, they were always drinking. It was always, you know, there was, that was like, like Rick's thing was fucking drinking. Like they, a bar here, bar there. It was always a, you know. 
big drinking culture. What about the yeah. construction yeah. crew? Was there a lot of drinking on the construction crew? Yes. So for me, I didn't drink. I mean, I drank, but I didn't drink. Like, you know, I'd buy a six pack of beer. It'd last me two weeks, you know? So, I mean, I drank technically, but you didn't, you didn't a, drink to the level that was expected in the, Oh my God. You <laughs> that, don't even, there it is, Titus. That's why you weren't accepted because you <laughs> couldn't binge I, drink. I actually, I actually wasn't, I actually wasn't because my thing, I grew up in Hawaii. So as I got older, you know, I, you know, I'd smoke a little weed. So I would, you know, I found a way to find a little bit of weed. And, uh, I remember, yeah, I puffed a little weed once. And, you know, did they Boney, know about that? Cause you know, weed was like a big Boney found out and it was like, and so he was just like, you, I'm, I'm like, what's your problem? You know, I was like, I took a couple of hits, no big deal. I don't do it all the time. I, you know, a friend of mine that I knew gave me a little bit and it's all gone now. You know, it was just like a little, like half a joint or something. And I, I remember he caught me and, uh, it was like, I told, I go, so you and the other guys, can get shit faced every night. And I smoke a little weed and that's not okay. And he's all, well, weed is illegal. I go, okay. So that was his logic. He's all, you represent Maryland. You represent, you know, you represent this, you know, this Maryland and Gary and all these things. And you're here smoking pot. We can't have you smoking pot. And I'm like, okay, well, I'm not a drinker. And you guys go. And I said, I don't want to sit because they would, the other guy, they would sit in the truck or they would, and they just smoke cigarettes and get shit face hammered every night. And Which is was, way more dangerous. Like, do you, have you ever seen that <laughs> that funny meme? Or I don't know where I saw it, but it was like, I don't understand why well, weed is legal in a lot of places now. But it's mm. like, I don't understand why weed is 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 illegal and drinking is legal. When I, <laughs> I, I drink, I do stupid shit. When I smoke weed, I just want to <laughs> mix all the sauces and be a better friend. <laughs> exactly. I want to sit here and watch some cartoons or something, you know? I'm like... Yeah. Do you remember hearing Get too creative. that I don't know I don't know which leader said this, but supposedly John said one of those oh, things. Well, John said, if you smoke weed, your spirit, your spirit will leave your body you. for four yep. days. Yep. I'm your like, okay, sign you. me up. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds great. <laughs> your spirit's just like, I'm out. I'll be back. <laughs> I yeah, no, I knew what you're about to say because I forgot that was yeah. Your spirit leaves you for like four days or whatever. So, but when you get I blackout get drunk, it's just your brain that leaves you. And who needs that? Yeah, yeah right. Totally. <laughs> well, when like, you're, when you're John have... and you get blackout drunk, you time travel. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean, your inhibitions that get lowered when you drink are way different than when you smoke pot. You know, like so way more true. bad shit happens when you're drinking. You know, I would okay, say that was so. kind of the so leading up to what I got kicked out over. You know, I... We were all drinking at a, at, this was kind of after I, I was kind of like sliding away from the church. I wasn't really coming to every church. They had it, they had it, they had it broadcasting on a radio station. So you could sit out in your car and listen to it. <laughs> so I, I would do a lot of, I would that. park in the parking lot and then, you know, listen in my truck. <laughs> you, would you light a J and like listen to the word? <laughs> yeah. <or> no. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. That'd have been great. Uh, so yeah, I was kind of drifting away. I wasn't really, you know, I was just kind of, and you got to remember, I lived on a island where you could go a hundred miles in a circle, you know? So when I got to LA, it was like, I had a car. I'm like going and exploring, you know, I'm just like driving and keep on driving because there's no end to it, you know? And so I was just exploring a lot and I started doing my own thing, meeting other people, you know? Doing yeah, your uh, own thing, Titus. How dare you? Yeah, like, it is highly my, frowned upon to do your own thing. <laughs> wasn't a slave to the church, you know? And and uh, and then one, so a bunch of the kids my age were over at someone's house and we were drinking. And uh, one of the girls jumped in my lap and, you know, and said hey <laughs> one thing led to another and uh i think the next morning she felt guilty and uh decided to go you know rat herself out to the to the you know police <laughs> not to police, the shepherds the church shepherds might uh, as well have been the police <laughs> <pretty> <laughs> what much, it felt like. church gestapo uh so <laughs> uh so yeah she you know and uh they 
So I think that's what happened. And then like a week later, two weeks later, I get, they're having like a feast service and, uh, they like, it was like, Hey, uh, one of the shepherds said, Hey, can you, can you come with me? Grandma, I want to talk to you. She was all smiley about it. You know, and I was like, Oh, okay, cool. You know, let's see what they have to say. And so they put bring me into the back room and there's just like, everybody's there. Millers to you know all the shepherds because it was a feast service too, so everybody from our surrounding churches were there. So all the big hitters were there, and then it so was you led- walk into a room that's f- f- not only Gary and Marilyn, the leaders, the big cheese leaders of the church, but then 12. all these. Yeah, I got. Oh, like, I, my, I, <laughs> I gotta say that's that's pretty fucking cool, Titus. I mean, so far, like you got, you the got the all whole, the heavy hitters in there. <laughs> it was definitely. I was important enough that this is how this was going to be dealt with and then they were and then it was had by gary and marilyn and that's terrifying though for i mean for anybody who grew up the way we did like you'd walk into that and just your stomach would drop right like no i thought i was like oh what's going on you're gonna make me a shepherd (laughs) oh really (laughs) oh no that's even worse because then you're like blindsided you know you don't know what's i'm like oh shit this must be important (laughs) looking around and everybody and then i'm starting to see like the you know, and then they're just like, you know, Gary, little short ass dude fucking looking at me with his fucking goatee and shit. Uh, <laughs> he's just like, hey, so we warned you about this stuff. Uh, but you forced our hand and, uh, you know, you this you've you've done this again and you're and you're, uh, you know, you've wormed your way into this girl's pants and slimed your way it was just like the way they made me feel like well, more like they were implying that you they were implying that, that you I seduced coerced her. her and, and seduced her to do this you know like it was all me and i convinced her to have sex with me you know when you know <laughs> when the truth was at the party she jumped in, like i was she wasn't even on my radar but she jumps in my lap and says hey you know take me home and i'm like Okay. Right. And you're 23 years old. Like, I mean, come on. And a little liquored up and feeling good, you know, yeah. and she was the same age and wasn't anything weird, you know, and it's just, you know, it's just sex was not okay in the church if you weren't married. And, you know, well, and it was okay for long- some people if you were like Rick Holbrook yeah, to have sex with whoever under- you wanted. <laughs> and you got to understand that it comes from a long line of every relationship that you ever, you always tried to do it right. You submit the relationship and it was always fuck no. You're not old enough. Mm-hmm. Then I'm 23. You're not all, you, you're not. No, no, no. It's always no. Any and then if you, I had relationships with you know girls in the church, you know, and uh, you always had to like. I remember one the one girl that I had a relationship the whole year <laughs> that I was in Shiloh the when I was in ninth grade and went to school. You know, the only place that I could really ever see her was at school. So I remember it was the first time I had ever got perfect attendance, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and uh, that was like the first time you loved somebody, you know, you're young, but it was just hell no. You, and it was, but it was all, you did it anyway and you had to keep it just like, you know, you they did, they, they were really, they policed relationships very intensely and yeah. I, who knows why, but it, you're right. That was usually no, you can't date this yeah. person. It was or always you, no for you, me. It was hell no it, for me. It, <laughs> yeah. You know, See, I mean, I I wonder about that. Like, what were they? Did they just want to choose our partners for us? Is that what it came down to? I mean, what's it, the process? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, what's the process? Arranged marriages. It, well, the thing was, it was just like when somebody got married in the church, it was like, holy shit, they did it. <laughs> Somehow, whatever they... They checked out every box. They were perfect for each other. Soulmates. They related to each other perfectly. They vetted each other for each other. And then there was a fucking marriage. It was like, holy shit. I think I saw maybe like through the 20 years that I was there or whatever. It was like I saw maybe five people get married. Well, I take that back. I saw Rick get married twice. <laughs> <laughs> and it didn't stop there. Yeah. Well, actually, no, right? Oh my God. And that was, you know, so anyway, they, they get me in that room and you're just, they tell me what a piece of shit I am. And I didn't feel like defending myself. I just remember looking at him and going, you know what, if you are who you say you are, 
and you're this, you know, all seeing people and you all, you know, like God talks to you and shit, then go talk to God and ask him what really fucking happened that night. You know, Mm -hmm. it wasn't this fucking story you're telling about me right now. And then I think they went. And so, and then, so in there, so they're like, all right, well, you're done. We got to set you out. We're going to, we're going to make an announcement in the church. Nobody's allowed to talk to you. You can't come around here no more. You're done. You know, which was just like. At that's the moment, what they was, would say. That's what they called it. They would set you out of the body. Yeah, meaning you were you set were out. I was no longer welcome. Out. And I, I remember when people get set out and you're just like, what'd they do? You know, it was like a big deal to be set out because it was like an announcement in the church. I remember being on the other end of it, hearing the announcement like, hey. We set so and so out of the body at this time. They're not allowed, and rah, 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 you know. They set Rick out like fucking four times. Yeah, and went back like the next. All for week. show because they. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was gonna yeah. ask what was Gary referring to when he said we've warned you about this before. He he mentioned to, they. Had, I think Scott had told me one time or whatever, and they you know, I was fooling around with another girl. You know, and uh, they said, hey, you know, can't do that. Which is like, OK, <laughs> I got to say the double standard there. I mean, okay, and fooling let's... around was like, you know, like we were dating when we shouldn't have been and we were doing our own thing anyway. And we were, you know, kissing and, make, you know, making out and stuff like that. So. What's wild about it is like you're a young man, like you're doing things that normal young people do or just normal humans do at a certain starting from a certain age. Like you're yeah. you're wanting to date. You yeah. have hormones like you're doing you're not yeah. doing anything wrong, but they're making you feel like. And you said in our conversation prior that like you've really carried this with you throughout the years that they yeah. really led you to believe that you were this piece of shit. Yeah. Yeah, Which so is they, heartbreaking. They kicked, it is, and then when they kicked me out, it was it was devastating. You know, uh, I, I never, I was never allowed to date. I was never allowed to do anything. And I mean, and they abused the shit out of me. I did everything I can to do everything right. I always wanted. I was always trying to get on the, the shepherd list, and you know, and, and be a part of that. But it was just always, nope, nope, not at this time, not at this time. You can't date. You can't do nothing. And so, I mean. At 23 or 24, your your only natural response is just to kind of just, you know, well, fuck it. <laughs> I'm just going to yeah. start doing my own thing. And that wasn't OK. And then when I slept with that girl, it was just it was game over, you know. And then that was it just it ruined my life after that because everything I had ever known, everybody that I had ever known. And the fact that everybody fell in line and just was like, OK, with shunning me. And then, it, you know, you'd mm-hmm. see people like in a restaurant, you know, like, cause, you know, I still lived in the valley. So people would be at the, you know, and they'd just be like, oh shit, you know, or, uh, or wouldn't even you know, look like at that. you, talk to like, you. Like, I, I don't even know what they said about me because the way that people would look at me, you know, certain ones would just be like, fucking scumbag, you know, just like. They would, yeah, because they would <laughs> trash talk people that were set sure out they... or that left of their own accord. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, it was horrible. I left. I, I couldn't come around. My The only family I'd ever known. So then I, now I was stuck on the streets of L.A. <laughs> and that didn't go well, you know. Went to drugs. Uh, you know, drugs got so bad that, you know, in and out of jail every other weekend, L.A. County, all that stuff did, you know. You know, stuff like places I went that I never would, a person I would have never, you know, I... I take responsibility for my own actions, but I didn't have anyone to talk to. Uh, I wrote letters to come back, denied, told, you know, have a good life. You know, at this time, you're, we're not taking any new applicants, <laughs> uh, you know. And then so I eventually just medicated and it got out of control, spiraled into drugs, uh, you know. Yeah, started going to getting into trouble a lot. Hey, you know, then you're on the streets of L.A. and you start hanging out with other people that you've met, you know, and then, you know, I was always kind of a rebel in my own. So I kind of clicked more with like gangbanger style people, you know, like, you know. And so then they kicked you out of the of the church, but you still had a job somewhere. Yeah. And you were had still a really living. good job. OK, I had a really so good then- job, made really good money. And I, that's where I started meeting people was through my work and stuff, you know, okay. so that's kind of how I started going, okay, well, 
I didn't have any friends anymore. You know, it was just this weird fucking place. Scary. It's just shitty. So now you're like, okay. Because before that, you're always, you don't really make friends outside of the church. You know, you, you're just, that's like, that's your group. And it's weird because the way you felt about other people, like it was like, you know, maybe they'll get it one day, you know? And then it was like, let's, let's try to bring them to our church and, you know, this will be, yeah. you know, like we were the ones, you know, oh, let's go, let's go. I remember people would go to other churches and be like, you know, let's just minister to these churches and tell them how great we are and fucking, you know, like we're just the shit and you believed it. You know, I remember believing like, oh man, we're the ones, you know, like they made you feel like we were the ones, we were the ones that were going to bring in usher in the kingdom and all this stuff was going to be through us, you know, except, so, except not you anymore because you yeah, were kicked not out. me. Nope. Yeah. And I wasn't allowed back. And this was, and then you got to understand the four or five letters that I wrote were like over the like span of two years, you know, trying to come back. I would talk to my mom and she would just be like, well, just, you know, keep trying. So you, <laughs> you though, you had this good job and you had a place to live. Why did you end up on the streets? Why did you end up? Because I was starting to really do my own thing and medicating through drugs and drugs took a hold of me and took me to a point where I was no longer uh, functioning. All I wanted to do was drugs. Like the drugs that I was doing were really, you know, they're not just pot. <laughs> why did you, you know, why so, did you go to that? Why did you start doing that? Because that made me feel good. Made me, you know, when I felt bad, I was feeling good. You know, uh, would you say that, w would you say that it was like, you know, they had just broken you down so intensely. And I know you said to me in our previous conversation that you just like really struggled with these feelings of low self-worth and they made you believe you were a piece of shit. So, I mean, that when you're abused like that, it is easy to go to drugs, to self-medicate, to just numb those feelings that are so intense, like the self-hatred. And then you've lost everything you ever knew. You've been kicked out from your family, basically. Yeah, all the through all the, you know, shit that I went through and then them kicking me out was just the. There's there's no other feeling like it, you know, because you are you just. Everything, you known, they have now said you are not. Worthy of that, you know, we you you are not it's kind of hard to explain, but when they set you out, it's just like you are no longer welcome here. And everything that you are now, now you're because now because we always look at other people out in the world as like the others. And now I was an other and we were above the others. So now I felt extra low because now I just I'd, I'd finally done it. Like I'd, I'd, I'd pushed them too far and that was it. And there was just, you know, this the sinking feeling that you get of just losing everything. You know, it was horrible. And so you start to try to figure out like living in the real world, you know, with no church, with no friends, with no nothing. Like, you know, you were always kind of protected everywhere you went because you always had a church group or, you know, you're, you know, you could go through things. You had people to talk to. No, I was on the streets of LA coming from Hawaii, which is just, you know, mm -hmm. the biggest thing I'd ever Overwhelming. lived in, you know, it's fucking freeways and, murder and <laughs> crazy shit you know like yeah. why you're very isolated and then i and then now i was forced to make a life in la <clears throat> and uh so yeah i went to drugs and the drugs were i started playing around with harder drugs and they you know you don't there's not a million addicts out there because the shit sucks you know so uh right. it took me to the point where all i wanted to do was drugs and eventually i lost my job uh, so then I started robbing, stealing, breaking into cars, doing shitty ass things. I lived on, you know, I was homeless for a little while and, uh, <clears throat> uh, went to the deepest, darkest places I never thought I would go. And, uh, you know, my fit <clears throat> in all of that, my faith did is what eventually really saved me in knowing that I was better than what I was doing. And, uh, but that's how powerful drugs are. You know, they take you to do things you would never 
in your right mind ever do. But when you want to get high, you you don't have a job, you don't have money. It's like, you got to do what you got to do. And so, uh, I had one incident where I got in trouble in Mexico, made it across the border and woke up in the San Diego County jail. And, uh, I remember I got out and they, Gave me a dollar fifty bus pass, and I said, "Well, I live in L.A." And they're like, "We don't give a shit. Get the fuck out of here." And uh, so I called a friend of mine, and he said, uh, <clears throat> "I was like, hey man, I, I need you to come get me." He's like, "What the fuck, you know?" And he's like, "Look, I'll come get you, but if I come and get you, I'm going to put you in rehab." And I said, "Okay." I had nothing left, like I had nothing, and uh, so he took me to Salvation Army. I did a six month program there and never looked back, you know, wow. got a job, got back on my thing, you know, got back going again, built my life again, you know, uh, I got, a, yeah. I got a question about that Salvation Army, um, experience and I don't know much anything about it, but can you, what was it like? How, what do you think the most, um, the most important factor in, in that experience, like what, what helped you in that, uh, re rehabilitation? Well, they, they give you a place to live. They work you all day. Uh, you get paid a little bit, but part of the program is you get free room and board. It's not really free. They, they sign you up through your social security and they get you like benefits. So they're, so the benefits through the social security go to the ARC which is the adult Re rehabilitation center. Um, and so they take, they get money for that. They work you in the, um, the, the one that I went to, they work you in the, in the store during the day or in the warehouse, like separating donations that come in, you work in, they have you in different departments, you know, you could work at clothes or in the furniture that comes in. It's crazy. The amount of things that people donate. And so, what they do is they, anything that they don't want to sell in the store, they put into auction and then they'll do auctions like every other day or whatever it was. And, you know, they sell off whatever they don't want to really sell in the store as, and make money off of. And uh, so, but so and then, so you live there and so you're there 24 seven. They don't really let you leave the building when you're first come in. You have to be clean to get in too. So I had to clean up off of drugs before I, you know, for a week, I had to get it all out of my system. And uh, then I was allowed to come in. And then so, you say, so you, go ahead. Oh no, well, I was going to ask, what's the difference between that and the uh, boot camp, Shiloh boot camp? Uh, they don't uh, break you down. They try to lift you up. They have programs. They take you to meetings. You know, they... They're real, you know, you're, you're around a group of guys that are trying to get clean too. So there's a lot of meetings, a lot of, you know, uh, uh, like building up kind of things like talking your feelings out, helping each other, writing stuff down, just kind of, you know, keeping the addicts mind going, keeping them, giving them a, a routine so they don't, you know what I mean? So you kind of work and you eat, you know what I mean? You kind of, you, you build a routine of life at this ARC. And in the, in the spare times, you know, you get, you get rec time, you get, but you just have, you know, you have other addicts and you other talking to other people and a lot of, you know, you, you get a lot of help and, you know, a lot of help. They want they want you to rehabilitate, so you know, so it's and then supportive. If you, it's yeah. And then a supportive if you complete, atmosphere. Yeah. And if you complete the six months and graduate, they give you, uh, they get you a job, they get you a place to stay, you know, uh, there's, Benefits in finishing the program. A lot of guys didn't because they just, you know, they mm -hmm. screw up and go it's out. Hard, I'm sure. Get high, yeah. yeah. And I was just done. You know that that last little stint. You know, I was done. Like I was going to jail. I remember I got arrested and I got out at noon. I was back in jail by two o'clock that night. <laughs> you know, yeah. I was just I was a wreck. You know, L.A. County is no place anybody should ever go. That place is you know, it, what, <laughs> miserable. What makes me so sad about just, I, I didn't know you went through all that and I'm really sorry. And I think I, it, it's so commendable that you got yourself out of it. Like yeah. that's huge. A lot of people it, never do. A lot what, of people never what do. Makes me, what makes me so sad is like, oh, 
the recklessness of the people in leadership and the way they treated you and kicked you out so callously. Mm -hmm. It's like they, they, the way that they behaved with humans, with all of us was so reckless because they didn't think about the consequences of, you know, how no. they are treating people, how they, they what they're care. leading you to believe about yourself and how that can lead. If you're a sensitive person, mm-hmm. like that's going to destroy you. Yeah. And then what's really fucked up is that then they'll take what you went through and say, oh, see, we were right about him. He's just right. a fuck up. Exactly. exactly. Instead of yeah. taking responsibility. Mm-hmm. Go, sorry, yes. Scott. Were you no, say? I was just, yeah. I was going to agree that same thing. There's a lot of like, you can look at this and you can say, oh, they identified you as a bad kid from the beginning yes. and you needed help. But it's exactly what you're saying, Charity, is that they they had this thing. They they thought they fucking knew. They thought they had the divine intuition <laughs> of God and that anything that they did and the way that <clears throat> they did it was right. But they honestly were the biggest idiots in the world and they made things mm. worse for people. They didn't. They mm-hmm. had an opportunity to 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 help people. They were in this place. They yeah. promised that they were going to help, but what actually worked? And you're at your Titus. You're talking about a a point that is so low. Most people can't imagine being at this at this place, and mm-hmm. that is that is tough, and it requires an immense amount of strength to get out of it the way that you have, and the support that you received, the positive uplifting treating you like a human support is what helps not the breaking you down and pushing you until you're nothing and treating you like you're nothing and just pulling you into a room when you're a fucking kid and saying you're an asshole that does the opposite of what they wanted and Mm -hmm. It's it's just the contrast, I think, is just incredibly striking and really. Impressive. And then trying to have relationships in the future, you're just, you know, they mm-hmm. have just always got this, you know, I'm not, you know, not good enough or, you know, you, you just have this, in, this, you know, inner dialogue yes, with yourself. Dialogue. Always, oh, you know, there's no harsher critic than me on myself, you know, and you. You know, here we go again. You know what? It, you know, you you just you're oh uh, here. You know, you're just this is what you do. You're a fucking idiot. You know, you're just fucking up. You know. And, this uh, is a recurring theme that I hear from all of us, most of us who are born and raised in it, especially those of us who weren't like totally bought in, I guess, or maybe had an independent streak in it at the, and maybe even those that were super like good or whatever (laughs) is this like um innate sense of um i'm not worth anything i'm not good ever good enough i struggle with that big time i know scott and i've talked about that i've talked with a lot of people in our age our our generation that struggle with that and it's really sad i try to explain to people on the outside (laughs) that it's kind of the equivalent of having abusive parents that are constantly verbally uh, abusing you emotionally abusing you telling you're a piece of shit because the church leaders were we were made to believe they were like our parents so it is basically that so imagine you were brought up your whole young adult life being told this these lies would are essentially lies about yourself but then yeah. they embed themselves into your brain and you you struggle with that your the whole rest of your life yeah yeah it's a i think you're always constantly striving to be this thing that they want you like like what you you know that they they you know so you're always striving to be this thing that they that you know you've picked you know the the pinnacle of you know becoming a shepherd or APCO or, or whatever. Uh, so you're always striving and then never making it and always being beat down. You know what I mean? You're like never good enough. Nope. Always turned down. So you're just, you know, you just, everything, you everything to internalize that everything's a failure, you know? Yeah. Ah, well, why, why am I not good enough? Why, why, you know, so-and-so just became a shepherd. Guy's an idiot. <laughs> yeah. Well, and well that that's the requirement, up. Titus. That's that you have to be an idiot. Yeah. I started Ooh. to see it later on that it was like most of the people that they did want in leadership were very narcissistic. And if you yes. weren't, if you actually had com- genuine compassion or anything like that, you'd get kicked out pretty quickly. From in leadership. my opinion, 
Well, the way I perceive them, they were the best snitches. Those the people that yeah. I saw, they were the ones that would tell on a friend. And I, that's something I would never do, you know, like someone tells me, you know what I mean? Like that's in secrecy or that's, you know, like that's in confidence or whatever. But these people are like, they would foam at the mouth to rat a buddy out or to, you know, mm. to tell you, oh shit, we got one, you know, we yeah. got to bring them in. Let's fucking, you know, <laughs> let's. It's that competition. Kick them out of the church. Let's, you know, let's fucking get them. You know what I mean? Like, and they loved it. You know, they'd get in there and they're just all, they'd huddle around you and just swarm you, you know? And they were just, you could see it in their face that they were just like, oh, we got you now, motherfucker. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was very, very sadistic. Yes. Very sadistic. Yes. Like they got um, off and like, of let's, making you hurt. <laughs> oh, for sure. And like, let's talk about too the double standard, right? Of kicking someone like you out. Yeah. You really didn't do anything wrong. You were being like a normal young man. I and took my medicine. I was okay, but yeah, then, but then they never let you back. So I mean, but so <laughs> let's talk about Rick Holbrook, okay? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> because here's somebody who not only was times. he a <laughs> yeah, a sexual predator had multiple affairs, and mm-hmm. uh, he was just appropriate on uh, appropriate, ugh, inappropriate on yeah. so many levels. Yeah, and yet they consistently brought him back in. Not yes. only was he a- allowed to be a part of the church, but he was in leadership. There's oh, yeah. a huge double standard there because you weren't doing anything to hurt anybody, and he mm. was. Yeah, yeah, and people Did- and all the kids looked up to him. Oh, Rick, he's the Rick would come and you're like, oh, cool, Rick, you know? And I was telling, I remember I was talking to you, Charity, about, you know, when we were in Yasp and stuff, when he would roll around, you know, he would hit up, he would do his rounds, hit up all the dorm rooms, you know, and he would always come into our dorm rooms and be like, you know, and I remember him talking about Shalom and being like, so what do you think about Shalom? You know, she's pretty, you know, and all the boys at the time were like, you know, she was our age. So we had a right to be like, she's pretty. But, you know, you look back on it and you're like, what the fuck is this guy doing? You know, and you're like, who's the pretty ones? And, you know, who's the ones? And then I remember him telling us about how he his favorite thing to do was to uh, do dorm room checks on the girl side just to catch them in their, you know, like in their their towels and stuff like that or whatever. That's uh, sick. It is. So he's yeah. so he's coming into a dorm dorm room and full of us teenage boys. This. Yes. And he's how old at the time? Probably oh, like God, in his thir- 30s. 30s yeah. Or, yeah. 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 But when he came in, we were all, you know, we're all 14, 15 year olds and you know, we're talking about girls and whatever. So at the time you don't really see the how wrong it is. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And so you're older and you're like, yeah, this was an adult, like, you know, dishing on 15 and 14, 13 year old girls, you know, that were all, you know, so yeah, yeah, the dude was a fucking scumbag. Yeah. And that's what he was telling you guys. I mean, he was actually, and and we were like, oh yeah, you know, that's cool that you got, you're like, oh, you lucky, you know, so-and-so. And and he was like, oh, so-and-so had little itty bitty titties or whatever, you Mm -hmm. know, like sick shit. And this is the, this is the role model for, for boys coming up in the, in the church too. This is like, you're, you're, he's doing double damage by visiting all the dorm rooms. Not only is he doing yeah. the damage of busting in on teenage girls when they're yeah. naked or half naked, whenever he's also then coming into all the boys and being like, this is a cool thing to do. So, and we all around. thought he was cool, you know, yeah. cause it was like, Oh yeah, you, Oh man, <laughs> you know, and we all yeah. thought he was cool for doing that, but you yeah. don't realize oh, that's fucked up. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know, in retrospect of being kicked out, I feel like it was the best thing that ever happened for me. I feel like truly the God that I know had his hand on me and got me the fuck out of there. My path wasn't easy, but in the end, when I I remember the November that it happened because I remember hearing all these things and then I didn't realize how much of a prison I was in. Cause I always had this in the back of my head. Oh, you know, maybe one day I'll go back, you know, maybe they'll, they'll let me come back. It's like 20 years later. And uh, when the, when I found out that it was all crumbling down, you know, Facebook blowing up. And I was just like, holy shit, right? Like, the, I, you just figured the Church of the Living Word was going to be eternal. You know, like there was, you would never what they said. imagine yeah. this happening. So it was crazy, right? And then I realized there was no church that I could go back to anymore. And I then I realized 
that I was imprisoned and didn't even realize in this invisible prison of I'm still outside of the church. So now there was no church to be outside of. You know, wow, for 20 yeah. years, you have this, I'm outside of the church, but you're still, you know, you, you learn to function, you know, in the wastelands of outside the church, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and then it was gone. And then I realized, holy fuck, I've been wanting to go back forever and subconsciously thought that I would. And then once it was gone, I was like, there was no church to go back. And I was just like, holy cow. That's amazing. This feeling I, that I didn't realize that I was harboring this one day, you know, thing. And then I felt free. And then, you know, the next week, you know, the paradise fires happen and my fucking house burns down. So it was like the church crashed, my house burned. I had nothing <laughs> but the clothes on my back that I went to work with. And I felt like God just cleaned fucking house on my life. And literally just everything. So I, in that moment, it, there was this freedom that I got, you know, of just, you know, I didn't even have car keys anymore. You know, you just, I didn't have a car. It was just, I had the clothes that I left to go to work with, you know, that was it. That's all I owned in my whole entire life now. And it was, once you accept it, it was freeing. I was like, all right, God just pretty much in the same, the, the week after the church goes down, I just felt like it was the spiritual house cleaning that God did for me. And I was it's very symbolic very, yeah, just have the church collapse and then have your whole then, life burn down. Yeah. You know, and start and over like, like a Phoenix rising yeah, from you're the forced ashes to become this new creature. Cause now truly everything that you ever were, all the little trinkets and pictures that I had from the past gone, there's no remnant of what I've known from the past. So it was just this cleansing once you accepted it, you know, and then the blessings that came after it, of all, you know, through the fires and the, you know, the insurance monies and different things I was able to rebuild into, uh, you know, into this fantastic thing. Well, that's, and, uh, uh, yeah. Charity and I talk about that all the time, or at least I think about it a lot too, is, um, I think a lot of people that have, that got kicked out or left the church got really good at rebuilding. That's uh, something yeah. <laughs> that we are very yeah. used to is starting a new life because it does mm -hmm. require a reconstruction. Yeah, yeah, it does. You know, the, and it was like when charity asked me to do the interview, it was, I was like, well, I had, I had talked to her cause I saw you guys that did the, you know, the, the other episodes and stuff. And I remember reaching out to charity and I was like, I was just telling her how proud I was and it, it meant a lot to me. And, uh, you know, and then we left it at that. And then she, you know, a few months later, as of recent, she asked me to do the interview and it was just, I was like, okay. And then all of a sudden it was like this two week turmoil of, it started with me trying to figure out what I would say. And then I was like, holy shit. It started bringing up all these, you know, thoughts and I, and I got angry. I got mad. I got just, you know. How am I going to tell my mom? I'm going to, you know, if she sees this interview, she'll fucking disown me, you know? Uh, and you just, it's, they got such a hold on you. It's so ridiculous. And I had to, you know, I had to say what I needed to say to, you know, and whether this helps somebody or not, I'm not sure. But for me, it's validating and saying my story out loud to somebody that, knows it because I've told my story and people are like, wow, that's fucked up, dude. <laughs> but to tell it to people that were a part of it, you know, yeah, and to let them know like, Hey, this is what really fucking happened. <laughs> and that's real. You know, not what I'm not sure what the church told you, but you know, yeah. I wasn't a piece of shit well, fucking person that they made me out to be. Not at all. And I mean, I, I've known you since we were like 12 years old or I mean, yeah. you're a little older, just a little older yeah. than me, but like, yeah, around that age, mm -hmm. I always thought you were a wonderful person. And it's like, then they, and of course I heard the things that they would say about you after mm -hmm. they kicked you out. Cause they talked that way about anybody that yeah. left or voluntarily or involuntarily. Yeah. But it's, um, I did not know what you went through. And I, even in our preliminary conversation, mm -hmm. we didn't get into that. What you Well, we cut it short because we didn't want it to, to fall flat yeah, in, I, the, I in the to, real interview. To save, the, <laughs> save the gold. Yeah. But when you did reach out to me on Facebook, um, was a couple months ago and you just, you talked a little bit about some of the things that you'd gone through and with the boot camp and getting kicked out and that, um, I, I just felt like what well, this guy has a lot 
to share. This is really important for other people to hear. And, and then the more we talked, I was like, I really, I really did feel like it would be healing for you to be able to say the truth and to say how this has affected you all these years. And and also to set the record straight, so to speak about who you are as a person, because those motherfuckers should not have the last word about who Titus Walker is. Exactly. You know, and, and everything that's come from it, like just, you know, going through all the things in the trials that I went to those deep, deep, dark places, you know, and then to be able to look over the edge and pull yourself back and make it back to reality. You know, you, you, you become, you become a strong person, you know, and the, and the things that you, you were, you learn to, you know, you count on yourself and the things that, you know, my faith, you know, knowing that I was destined or better than, you know, living a life and of drugs and shit like that, you know, yeah. or whatever, you know, and Absolutely. it's even they, they never. And one of the things I was telling somebody was the biggest bummer that I feel that I've seen through all your guys' episodes with different people is that you had people that probably once in their life believed in God, but after this experience want nothing to do with them. And to me, that's the fucking mm-hmm. tragedy, you know, because <laughs> I, you know, whether they were, I don't know whether they really got a real chance to have a relationship with God or whatever. I don't well, know. Yeah. It it's like, so it wasn't, it's, it, it's like robbing poison. people of the choice in a way where it's like, you're not deciding on your own. Well, do I believe in God or don't I believe in God? It's like, yeah. well, I kind of don't because this is what, how yeah. God was represented. If this to me. is how it works. Yeah. I don't want to be a part of it. You know, like, can I ask you what what was it over the years that made you still want to be a part? Like what was it you felt like you were missing out on? That was my family. Yeah. It was everybody I'd ever known. Like I said, I was born into this shit. There wasn't a day I didn't know this church. You know? Mm-hmm. That was my family. That was my people. That was my That was my safe space, you know? Like when I even when I was in so Hawaii, did- my church was where I would go because it wasn't Hawaii school, you know, couldn't wait to go to church. Cause that was where my, my safe place was. And, you know, all the people I loved and all the relationships that I'd ever had were in that church, you know, and you just, I always felt that they were, it was even, even, <laughs> you know, I justified them even at the years following, uh, you know, all throughout the years as well, they had to do what they had to do. You know, they had to, you had to keep the atmosphere pure. So I obviously needed to go, you know, and I was. Just, and then w- once you heard all of the shit that was actually going on, <laughs> were you just like, oh, my God, the atmosphere was not pure and it wasn't my fault. <laughs> nope. And I'll tell you what, you know, they. It was a perfect ending, you know, mm-hmm. to 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 have lived that and then see the hypocrisy in the end. That when I got kicked out, that I feel like it was for a reason other than them, because I feel like the next 20 years after that was a complete shit show. (laughs) And it was better that I was off. I can attest to that. (laughs) (laughs) You know, and I feel like, you know, it was just unrecognizable when it fell apart. And I was just like seeing all the things and all that. And I was just like, what fucking what happened? You know, and uh I don't know. It doesn't yeah, sound all that just, great when uh, you were a part of it either there, Titus. Uh, no, for no, kids. for sure. <laughs> for sure. But it just, you know, just the yeah. fact like, because I never knew there was sexual abuse going on. You know, that yeah. was never, nobody ever touched me wrong or, you know, or, or, you know, that was never, my shit was just more mental breakdown, you know? So, mm-hmm. but, so I never, so to hear that and and then to just, you know, like I said, even when they kicked me out, that was, I was just like, you know, they know better, you know? So to hear that they were complicit to this was just fucking what the fuck. And it took me a long time to accept it. And after talking to that one girl, you know, hearing that, I was just like, are you, you know, like you're, it's hard to unpack what these people were to people. They were fucking God, basically, you know? The people, the amount of dedication that these people had, the money that they gave, the time that they gave, it's just, you know, and then find out that they're frauds. (laughs) 
What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> they ruined people's lives and they were just giant. And they used God's grifters. word to do it. So Yeah, that's so gross. I feel like right? there's a you know, they'll have to answer for that. Well, we really appreciate you sharing your story. Yeah. Cause it's it's I just think it's such a great um example of the way that they can really fuck with people's lives just with their stupid ideas of the way the world works, you know? So think, and it's, I think it's just going to be so healing for, like you were saying, it's going to be healing for a lot of people to be able to hear your story um, and hear your side of it. And there's just, it's, it, it never ceases to amaze me that the different ways that they come up with, um, you know, torturing people. I mean, these like boot camps and stuff and, you know, just like on and on. And like yeah. the, the story, like the, the room with everybody, you know, standing around you and the personal exiling of, from Gary and Marilyn, you know, all that stuff is just like, yeah, it's rough. And when and I got to see trouble, you come it was out big. of it. Yeah. <laughs> right. that's, that's how you say it. That's right. That was Titus Walker. That was, that was amazing. That was, uh, a really, really, um, God, it just, his experiences were so, so interesting and just very similar, but very unique, you know, from some of the stories that we've heard. Um, and the treatment just really like he was expendable the whole time, like use him as much as possible, break his spirit, put him to work and then ditch him the second he steps out of line just a little yeah. bit. Um, it's devastating. It's devastating. It is devastating. And it's really was kind of their recipe, right? For manipulation was, uh, he, like you said, he tried to be a good soldier. He tried to do everything that they wanted him to do. And as soon as he, you know, was like, I'm tired, I'm going to bed kind of thing after working 48 hours straight construction, suddenly he's like a piece of shit, you know? It just, it showed, it showed how hard they worked. They worked all of us. And especially those guys that were, you know, at the epicenter of the working hard, the construction crew that, that was, tasked with building the kingdom for Marilyn's heart. Like he said, all that crap, they just, they worked them to the bone, you know, and did, and cut, cut them no slack. It mm. was because you were building the kingdom, not you were doing this thing for a purpose. This wasn't like a job for him. Um, but and, again, that's like the, the it's a glaringly obvious that they valued the mission over the, the people. Right. And it was, people were expendable. The mission was like paramount to mm-hmm. anything else. I, I just, it really infuriates me, especially knowing now like what he went through after that, you know, getting into drugs and doing all that. It, it the like I said earlier, the recklessness of these people with the, as children, like they, yeah. we were so young when they were impressed and so impressionable when they were saying all these things to us. And so like you internalize all of that, uh, you, it, it becomes this self hatred, and yeah, it it makes sense to me that he t- turned to destructive behaviors, and mm-hmm. and it I I know I called it out in the like while we were talking to him, but I I just it it is just the contrast between the way that the church treated treated so called troubled youth um, compared to what actually worked for him is just so obvious. They had no idea what they were doing, and we've we've heard stories kind of floating around about this, uh, what we've been calling the bad boy boot camp. Um, but like it, it, he's just showing like they, they, they were trying to, they literally said it, they're trying to break his spirit. And that is like, not how you help people. If they were actually trying to help kids that were rebelling, um, you don't, you don't do it this way. Not even a little, no, it's yeah. like, it's like the 1950s style parenting, you know, spare mm-hmm. the rod, spoil the child. And it yeah. was, it, it's just such bullshit. And I like hearing him say that he wasn't the same after that, that his personality changed. He just wasn't himself. And it was because they didn't want him to be himself. Yeah. yeah they didn't cool. want people to be individuals. They wanted people to like conform to their exact, like, this is how you should be. 
don't have any opinions, don't... Ha- I love that he was outspoken and had a mind of his own, but like I've said a hundred times now, it's like you were especially picked on if you had a mind of your own. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is the perfect example of how they how they wanted to grind you down so that you would be what they wanted you to be, to mm-hmm. change your personality so that you were in you were being controlled by them because that ultimately is what it is when we hear from everybody like your experiences, Sam and Titus and anybody else that we hear this kind of stuff from is it's 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 the independence it's the choosing what you want for your life for your personality, who you want to be, um, that's the problem. Even to express yourself. Just yeah, even express, to express yeah. yourself naturally. Like, this is my personality. This is who I am. It's like, oh, well, we don't like that. So you better change it. It's really awful. <laughs> it is really awful. What I, what I also think is interesting is, you know, he he talked about in the um, Bad Boy Boot Camp. Um, was it just called Boot Camp? It's not Bad Boy Boot Camp. It was just Boot no, Camp. We, right? we just keep calling it because <laughs> they really weren't bad boys. Yeah. It was like, yeah, but we were, were saying it tongue in cheek. Yeah, yeah, it was just called the Boot Camp. Boot Camp. The During the Boot Camp, he was talking about they attacked those road bu- rose bushes and were clearing out the rose bushes. I, I found um, the 1990 YASP yearbook from the first YASP year. There, oh, yeah. and I'm sure there's other people that experience this too. Like they were still going after those rose bushes the next year and possibly oh, I know. I did further. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's just yeah. like, it was, so it, it, it shows very clearly how this boot camp was like, Hey man, this is really a great idea. Let's make it an institution. Let's make it young, young adult school of profits and we'll make mm-hmm. it a summer program where we like have the kids pay to come out and then they clear out all these rose bushes and do all this stuff. Cause like they saw this boot camp, apparently they saw this boot camp as a huge success. And then they modeled the ASP after it. That's true. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cause that's pretty much all we did was manual labor and it was peppered with uh, fun activities. If you can even call it that, but we, that it's so park. funny. Like, yeah, going to the, shittiest water park in the midwest and like swimming in the lake with leeches and yeah. uh yeah movie night it's just so stupid uh-huh. all of it and we paid the fact that like we paid to stay there our parents paid for us you know yeah, i know that's crazy um i think it's really inspiring that he you know was he after getting kicked out he's dragged down to the lowest point but then he was able to get himself out um, mm-hmm. is is really amazing. Just a good, just a just a really, really insightful interview all the way around. Yeah, he clearly has a very strong character. Mm-hmm. To be able to pull yourself out from that deep that depth of darkness, you know, says yeah. a lot. And I kind of wonder if it's like someone as strong as that, it's almost like the leadership senses that you have that kind of inner strength and they don't want you around because they know that ultimately they will not be able to manipulate you. Yeah, that's right. And so what use are you to them if they can't manipulate you? Yeah. And I think that underscores this thing, like what you're saying, his strength was always there. Um, Yes. You know, going through all of this, I think uh, some people say this makes me strong. This made me strong, like surviving this made me strong that he, he was strong the whole time and Absolutely. it was just really, if anything, that boot camp and just the experience in the church wore him down and made him not have faith in his own strength. And you can see that being kicked out, not being a part of the thing that's happening in the world. This is the thing. Like he said, he was like, he was always outside of the church. Even after he was outside of the church, he never left it. He was still in it. Because he identified, yeah, he identified himself as someone outside of it. And it was still the center until it crumbled. And he realized that it was when he was truly free. And I think that is, that is amazing. It shows the lasting damage that a place like this, it, it infects your brain, especially when you're born into this thing and you're told this is the world. This is it. Marilyn's heart is the thing that matters in this world. And to be trapped in it, even though you've been rejected by it, is the worst kind of hell, 
I can think. Absolutely. Because it's one thing to, to leave of your own accord to decide, you know, this isn't for me or you realize it's a call or whatever. But to be kicked out, I can only imagine that's just like that was something that I think a lot of us feared. Right. Is if I don't toe the line, I could be kicked out. And then it's just you're not prepared. You're just not mentally or emotionally prepared for that because it does feel like being kicked out of your family. Mm hmm. So Amazing. that would be really rough. Yeah. But yeah. it was really great talking to him. I'm so glad. I think it's a lot of people are going to identify with his story. And um, and I really want him to f find a deeper level of like healing for himself. And just to know that, you know, he's an amazing person. He is certainly not the piece of shit that they tried to convince him that he was. Guess who's the piece of shit? That's right. Gary Hargrave. <laughs> Let's all say it At together. <laughs> <laughs> oh man oh that's amazing okay awesome good job charity good job scott no one high five high five, high five. <laughs> we're such dorks <laughs> <laughs> i wouldn't have it any other way yeah exactly exactly gotten a lot of great feedback from you guys uh, after the first episode and we wanted to offer up an email address for you to send us your stories because a lot of you have really interesting experiences and thoughts to share we'd love to hear them and um perhaps we'll read a couple per episode we have a we have a link in the show notes to the email um, and if you send us your stories your experiences in those emails um, make sure you explicitly say that you are okay with it being shared. And you, if you prefer to leave your name off, just say that. We'll read it anonymously. And um, yeah, we'd love to hear from you because your voice matters. Okay. <laughs> yeah, because there are some really interesting ones that we've received. Um, just, and we've also heard, you know, over all this time, there's some really fun ones. So please, please send. send, please like, and subscribe, rate, review, five stars, please. <laughs> <laughs> And also go to Gary's podcast and give him zero stars. <laughs>